the rotting majesty, a white tiger's hidden horror. There is something hauntingly beautiful about the white tiger, a ghost in the jungle, a living enigma. Its piercing blue eyes cut through the shadows. Its striped coat gleams like silver under the moon. Every step it takes is pure poetry, powerful, precise, effortless. But tonight, something is wrong. A deep wound gapes across its powerful shoulder, a grotesque honeycomb of dissolving flesh, its edges discolored, swollen, and wet with a glistening film of thick yellow pus. The flesh is eaten away in chunks, revealing deep pockets of decaying tissue, tiny tunnels burrowed into the tiger's own body. From these pits of rot, a foul liquid seeps, Dirensiao, Iveskus, laced with blood and filth. A foul stench clings to the air, thick and nauseating. The unmistakable perfume of something still alive, yet already rotting. Flies swarm, their tiny legs coated in a layer of bacterial sludge as they crawl over the open wound, laying their eggs in the liquefied flesh. The tiger shudders as they land, its powerful muscles twitching beneath its ruined skin. It doesn't know what's happening to it. It only knows the pain, a deep, searing agony radiating from the infected wound, pulsing, throbbing, demanding its attention. Every breath it takes is ragged, its body burning with fever as it staggers through the undergrowth. This is the work of bacteria, unseen, relentless, and insatiable. The tiger is still alive, but it is being eaten from the inside out. The, the unseen killers, a world of microbial destruction, bacteria, the smallest of all predators, ancient, invisible, and omnipresent. They exist in the soil, in the air, in the water. They coat every surface, fill every breath, cling to every living thing. Some are harmless, some are even helpful, breaking down waste, digesting food, keeping ecosystems in balance. And then there are the others, the ones that do not live in harmony, the ones that do not coexist, the ones that do not simply survive. They consume when the tiger received its will, perhaps from a fight, perhaps from a hunting injury, perhaps from the sharp snag of an exposed tree root. Its body did what bodies are meant to do. It tried to heal, blood clotted, forming a thin scab, and deep inside, its immune system mobilized. White blood cells rushed to the site, ready to engulf and destroy any invaders. But bacteria are not passive participants in this war. They do not simply sit and wait to be destroyed. They fight back, a single cut, no matter how small as an open door and the bacterial horde has been waiting. In mere minutes, the wound is colonized. Millions of bacteria flood into the exposed tissue, slipping past the body's defenses, multiplying at an unfathomable rate. One bacterium becomes two, two pew become four, four becomes 16. Within hours, the tiger's wound is home to a thriving civilization of microscopic killers, each one producing waste, toxins, and enzymes designed to break down the very fabric of its body. At first, the damage is minimal, a little redness, a little warmth. The tiger feels a dull ache, but it presses on. Then the real damage begins. The first wave of bacteria attacks the connective tissue, breaking down the fibers that hold the tiger's flesh together. The skin loosens, pulling away from the muscle beneath. Then, a second wave moves deeper, targeting the fat cells, liquefying them into a thick, rancid sludge. Another species produces neurotoxins, shutting down the pain receptors in the immediate area, ensuring that the tiger doesn't react too quickly, doesn't scratch too hard, doesn't realize how bad things really are. By the time the body understands what's happening, it's too late. A war beneath the flesh. Bacteria are living creatures, and like all living creatures, they feed, but they are not delicate eaters. They do not nibble, they do not chew. They dissolve, they consume, they erode, Inside the tiger's body, the infection has spread. The wound itself is only the surface. Beneath it, the bacteria have infiltrated the bloodstream, hitching a ride on the very highways that keep the tiger alive. Now, with each pump of its powerful heart, the infection is carried further, deeper, to places no wound should ever reach. Its liver, its lungs, even its brain are now potential battlegrounds. The tiger's immune system fights back, deploying its last-ditch effort to contain the infection. Fever, the body raises its temperature, hoping to cook the invaders alive. The tiger burns from the inside, its breathing shallow, its head pounding, that the bacteria thrive in heat. Some species multiply even faster under these conditions. Soon, the tiger's strength begins to fade. Its vision blurs. The fever is not killing the bacteria, it is killing the tiger. The stench of death. Death has a smell. It is not like rotting meat or spoiled milk. It is deeper, richer, more pungent. 
It is the smell of a body breaking down before it has even died. The white tiger stumbles, its legs trembling beneath it. The wound on its shoulder is now a crater, its edges blackened, the tissue sloughing away in soft, wet sheets. Maggots wriggle inside, feasting on the decaying flesh. In a cruel twist of fate, they are helping. By consuming the rotting tissue, they are preventing the infection from spreading even faster. But it is not enough. The tiger collapses. Its breathing is slow, shallow, labored. Its once pristine fur is caked in dried blood and filth. The jungle around it is silent. Even the scavengers are waiting, a lesson in flesh. You might think, I'm not a tiger, so why should I care? But bacteria do not care if you are a tiger or a human. They do not see stripes. They do not see status. They do not see status. They see flesh. Ever had a small cut that became red, swollen, warm to the touch? That was bacteria trying to colonize you. Ever had a wound that began to smell? That was bacterial waste, toxins breaking down your cells, turning your own body into something alien, something putrid. Given the right conditions, one bad wound, one weak moment, one weak moment, one touch of the wrong surface, you could become their next feast. But let's not leave on such a grim note. If you ever get a nasty wound, just remember, Modern medicine has gifted us with antibiotics, bandages, and the luxury of hygiene. You, dear viewer, do not have to fight off a bacterial horde armed with nothing but your immune system and sheer willpower. You have soap, and if that isn't comforting, then just be grateful that you are not a white tiger in the jungle, slowly being eaten alive by something you cannot even see. Because in the grand battle between bacteria and flesh, the house always wins. The feast continues, when bacteria aren't the only invaders. The white tiger lies still, its once mighty body reduced to a trembling shell of fever and decay. The bacterial war inside it rages on, its flesh dissolving, its strength slipping away. But the jungle does not stop for the dying. And the bacteria are not the only ones feasting. In nature, there is no wasted meat, no vacant space, no mercy. Where bacteria soften the body, parasites move in to claim their share. You see, bacteria are blunt instruments, mindless consumers that dissolve tissue and spread their empire through sheer, unrelenting multiplication. But parasites, parasites are something else entirely. They are patient, calculating, opportunistic, calculating, opportunistic. And unlike bacteria, parasites want their host to stay alive, at least for a while. The puppeteers of the wild, the tiger's wound is a gaping pit of rot, but deep within its body, something far worse lurks, something older than the forests themselves. In inside the tiger's intestines, parasitic worms coil and twist, feeding off the nutrients meant to keep the great beast strong. Some have been inside for years, feeding, growing, laying eggs, tiny time bombs waiting to hatch and spread. These parasites do not want the tiger dead just yet. A dead tiger is a useless tiger, a living, breathing, suffering tiger. That is perfect for the parasites. This is the long game. One particular invader, a worm burrowed deep in the tiger's gut, does something extraordinary. It releases chemicals that dull pain, weaken the immune system, and make the host sluggish. The tiger should be writhing in agony from its infection, but instead, it barely reacts. It is tired, it is weak, it is vulnerable. And in this vulnerable state, other parasites take their chance to invade. A single mosquito lands on the tiger's fever-hot skin, stabbing its tiny needle of a mouth into the weakened flesh. It drinks deeply, filling itself with infected blood before taking off into the night. It does not leave alone. Inside that blood, a new kind of horror stirs. Microscopic parasites, protozoa, viral hitchhikers, and other invaders smaller than bacteria, but just as deadly. The mosquito is now a carrier, a winged syringe, ready to plunge into the next victim and spread the disease further. This is how the jungle works. Nothing is wasted, nothing is spared, a body under siege. The tiger moves again, dragging itself forward, not knowing that its body is no longer its own. Something is controlling it now, deep in its brain. Another parasite has taken root, a microscopic organism that does not kill, but commands. It sends chemical signals through the tiger's nervous system manipulating its thoughts, its instincts, its very will to live. The tiger, normally a solitary hunter, now has an urge to roam further, to get closer to others, to spread what it carries. It is not acting of its own free will anymore. This is not just an infection, this is mind control. And in the shadows, the jungle watches, waiting for its next victim, the parasites that inhabit us all. Now, before you start feeling too safe, consider this. Parasites are not just a problem for tigers, they are inside us. 
Right now, they live in our intestines, our bloodstream, our organs. Some are harmless, some even beneficial. But others, some even beneficial. But others, others are waiting for their moment. Ever had a sudden craving for something you normally wouldn't eat? Ever felt an itch you couldn't scratch? A discomfort you couldn't place? A fatigue that no amount of sleep could cure? It could be them. Some parasites hide in muscle tissue, waiting for the day their host is eaten so they can move on to a new predator. Others latch onto nerves, subtly manipulating behavior, changing habits, influencing choices. Some have even evolved to keep their hosts alive as long as possible, but only just enough to ensure they can keep feeding. And the worst part, most people will never even know they're there. So, the next time you feel a little off, just a bit weaker than usual, just a little hungrier, just a little more tired, remember this. Your body is a battleground. Bacteria are fast, brutal, mindless. Parasites are slow, calculated, patient, patient. But in the end, they are all feeding on the same thing, you.